All right. Hi, everyone. Um, it is so great to have you all here for Read, Rant, Relate virtual edition. Um, for those of you who are tuning in, I am Ann Mason. I am the producing artistic director of Relative Theatrics. And um, I'm just, I am beyond grateful that you all tuned in to join us here tonight. Um, I have some thank yous to, to put out there. Um, let's see, first of all, a huge thank you to Dr. Laura Delosier. Um, there is like, there aren't enough words to express how grateful we are for this partnership with her and with UW Classics and for all of the support over the last few years to continue to have um, read, rant, relate partnerships with the Department of Modern and Classical Languages at the University of Wyoming. Um, also a big thank you to the University of Wyoming Art Museum, um, especially to Katie Christensen and Rachel Cook. Uh, Rachel, thank you for putting together that PowerPoint so we could bring the art uh, to all of you here over the interwebs, um, as well as to our sponsors for this event, the Wyoming Humanities Council, the Wyoming Institute of Humanities Research, and the Classical Association of the Middle and West South Organization. They are all supporting phenomenal grant funding for us to put on this program. Um, in the description underneath the video, uh, there is a link to a survey. And so we would really appreciate it if after the reading, you could take a discussion, you could take a moment to head to that link and share your thoughts with us. That will be feedback that's really beneficial to all of our granting funders and for us to make sure that the programming going forward can best suit your desires and your needs. Um, I hope that you all, if you are in Laramie, are enjoying a wine and cheese from Chalk and Cheese in downtown Laramie. We're very grateful to Misty for doing a partnership with us where she is pairing um, a, a wine and cheese pair with the themes and feel of each of our readings, which I'm excited to announce that we will have a virtual reading every Friday this month at 7 p.m. Uh, so we hope that you can tune in for all of those in the future. We are offering these for free, uh, but if you feel, if you're feeling generous uh, and you wanna show your support for the arts and humanities uh, and for virtual community gathering places, then we would greatly appreciate um, a small donation of any amount that you feel fit. You can do that uh, through Facebook or pay PayPal. There's a link in the, um, in the description down below there too. Also, I should mention if you um, are hearing impaired and would like a transcript of this evening's reading, you can also um, click on the link that's in the description to receive that. Um, and I think that's all I need to announce for now. So I am going to go ahead and have our actors join us. Yay! We have all of our actors here. Um, so I would love for you each to introduce yourselves. Um, and if there's anything else you wish to share about uh, your past um, involvement with Relative Theatrics or anything else you feel like something that you're excited about for this programming. Um, but we'll start with Shanna. Hi, everyone. I'm Shanna Dana, and I am an alumni of the University of Wyoming, and I'm just very happy to be here. And I'm super excited about this program and what they're putting out there and like how on top of it they are to bring this to you in your homes in this wonderful trying time. So just got, glad to be here. Thanks, Shanna. Let's go to Jared. All right. Hi everybody, I'm Jared Morleva. I'm also a University of Wyoming alum. Um, I've done a couple of readings with Relative Theatrics in the past, but nothing uh, digital ever before. So I'm really excited to be a part of this. Leah? Hi, I'm Leah. Uh, I've been in a few of the Relative Theatrics shows, The Nether and Big Heartless. I've also done a few of the other readings. Um, I'm currently a junior in musical theater at the University of Wyoming. Awesome. Olivia? Um, hi, my name is Olivia Cole. I was um, in the most recent Relative Theatrics production of Really, 
Um, I am studying social science and gender and women's studies at the University of Wyoming, and this is my last semester, kind of. <laughs> I mean, it's all online now, but um, so I'll be graduating in May. And yeah, I'm really happy to help out with relative theatrics for this for this reading. And Alex. <laughs> I'm Alex Soto. Um, I'm also an alum of the University of Wyoming, and I am usually the production manager and the stage manager for Relative Theatrics, so it's really cool to get to perform again. Thanks, Anne. Yay. Um, I also forgot, I need to do one quick um, thank you as well to Noelle, who is doing the transcription for us tonight. So, um, it took a lot of people and a lot of hard work and the Relative Theatrics Board. Thank you to the Relative Theatrics Board of Directors as well. Um, a lot of scrambling and learning and figuring out how to do this virtually. Um, so, but it, it takes a village and we're so happy to, to be here with you virtually to read the Antigone Project. Um, so with, uh, with, I think that that's about all that we need to say at this point. Um, the reading's probably about 75 minutes, then we'll take a short break and come back for the discussion. Uh, for those of you that are on your computer, you can see um, to the, what is that? To the right of your screen, um, a chat bar. That's where you can leave your comments, ask your questions, and we'll be utilizing that um, for, for the discussion. And there are some really wonderful comments already, some, people from here in Laramie, also uh, folks from Jackson and all around the state. So thank you all so much for tuning in and um, uh, let's, let's get the show on the road, shall we? <laughs> okay, so this is a play in five cycles uh, and we have five different playwrights, short plays that use Sophocles' uh, Antigone, a 2,500 year old play about family and rebellion and government and um, the role of, of the institutions versus family choices to uh, actually respond to the Patriot Act in 2004. And now 16 years later, we are using this to revisit the myth in our present circumstances. Okay, I, I'm so happy to in introduce all of you out there watching. To, to Laura, Dr. Lo Laura Deloja, the most amazing, wonderful woman that really is like what, what made this the seed of all of this tonight. And Rachel is here too, Rachel Cook from the Art Museum, wonderful. Um, I would love to have each of you introduce yourselves and um, share whatever you wish to share. And then Laura, I'll just hand it over to you. Um, hi, my name is Laura Deloche. I uh, teach classics at the University of Wyoming, and I've had the pleasure of working with Anne and Relative Theatrics now for three years, where we do a play reading in conjunction with one of my spring courses. And Rachel? Hi, my name is Rachel Cook. I am the Curator of Academic Engagement at the University of Wyoming Art Museum. And as part of my job at the Art Museum, um, I get to work with fantastic humans and faculty who use the Art Museum um, throughout the semester for their classes. And so Laura and I work together um, on putting together the Teaching Gallery Exhibition, which is specific to her class. Mm -hmm. Well, Laura, I think I'll turn it over to you. Um, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. I noticed that there are some questions that's come in already on the chat, so thank you. And uh, there were several questions to the actors and to Anne about the challenges you faced from going when we had the rehearsal thinking about uh, an event on campus to creating community and theater in the virtual environment. And do you want to start that? Yeah, I was going to say, that's probably for me to start this one off, right? Um, yeah. Gosh, I mean, um, so what I've been telling a lot of people is that, um, yes, this is a really challenging time that we are all in. And um, when it comes to programming and having to, to shut everything down and excavate the, the, the theater or the art museum, the, the places where we 
physically gather in person with one another, even the rehearsal room. Like I, I haven't been back to the Relative Theatric Studio in like two and a half, three weeks, I don't know. And that feels weird to me. Like that's, that's a little bit unsettling. Like there must be ghosts in that space right now. Um, but at the same time, I feel like especially art artists, but I feel like especially theater artists are really good at adapting and creative problem solving and figuring out the way for, well, that cliche phrase, the show must go on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it really is just a matter of like putting on those thinking caps and coming together and saying, well, what can we do? What are the ways, like what is, for me, I'm always thinking like, what is the, what is the important element of this storytelling? What is, what matters? Is it, does it have to do with the fact that we have to be physically touching or sharing the same space? And like, yes, that does make a huge difference when, when all of us can be in the same room, there's, there is a, an energy that you can't replicate that virtually. You just can't. Um, but if you think about Read, Rant, Relate and you think about this program, it's about using stories, bringing stories to life, giving voice to scripts so that we can have a discussion and we can still do that virtually. It's just a matter of figuring out a new creative way to do it. So I don't, I'd love to hear from the actors in terms of like, especially, so we had to do a little bit of recasting and there are some, I think there are some bigger questions in terms of anything moving into a virtual a digital platform um, that are societal and need to be addressed um, in terms of like who has access to this platform, um, who has a webcam and a microphone or a phone that can pick them up, who doesn't have to be at home taking care of children um, with a quiet space that they can go away to, to do a reading. You know, there are definitely some questions there that are big picture um, societal things that, that you know, if, if this, if this new world order goes much longer, definitely need to be addressed. Um, but, but also, I mean, so, so yeah, so our original cast um, had a different makeup. And so we had um, Olivia and Shanna join, but there are pros to that as well, because for example, Shanna is um, a University of Wyoming graduate. We were in school together in the theater department and now she's a working actor in LA and gets to be here with us. So really cool that we can sort of break this space-time continuum to come together and tell stories. Um, but I guess maybe starting with like Leah, Alex, and Jared who were in the cast when we were supposed to do it at the art museum and then had to like moving with the play to this platform, I'd be really curious to, to hear your thoughts in, in response to this. Um, sure, I'll jump on this one. Um, it was a little stressful <laughs> just because I've never, you know, I've never done any sort of acting digitally before. So I didn't really know what to expect coming in. Um, but especially having been part of the cast when we were planning on doing the, the original in-person performance, um, just a weird shift like a whole new kind of mindset that you have to get into um kind of like when you take an online class for the first time you just sort of have to adjust to this new medium um and also at, at one point hopefully no one watching could really tell but my keyboard stopped working and i couldn't turn my camera off during the third piece i had to force restart my computer in the middle of it which was something i've never had to do but while acting there. before <laughs> Lastos is a lifelong casper native board member of Wyoming Humanities, alumnus of Spirit. Don't know what that was. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll go next, I guess. Um, yeah, there was just, um, like Jared said, definitely stressful. Um, and mostly just because I felt like there was almost a little bit more responsibility on my end of like, like I have, I rearranged my living room lighting situation to try and uh, make that a little better. And um, just a, a sort of weirdness in that in an in-person reading, you know, while it's not like a fully realized production with blocking and stuff, 
you're still seeing, you know, all of me in my my stature and my gestures and things like that. Um, and just having this this little world to live in um, was definitely, in in some ways, I guess, freeing in that I knew that only part of me could be seen, but also stifling um, because I knew that there might be some things that I I couldn't get across with just this little square. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and just just kind of strange to be sitting here in my own living room, knowing a bunch of people can see me right now, um, was just something weird. Because uh, you know, I I would practice, and I did practice this particular piece sitting on this very couch by myself sometimes when I was home alone, and now I'm here doing it again, but with a bunch of people watching me that I can't. <laughs> um, but definitely rewarding just knowing that I mean I saw at one point there were like 75 people watching and that is more than we probably would have had in person and that's just super incredible um, and amazing and that you know those people got to enjoy it in the comfort of their own homes doing what they wanted to do while seeing this cool theater. Uh, for me it was really new experience but I, I, I enjoyed it it's I've never really wanted to look into like the whole camera, like movies and stuff like that. Cause you're so up close and it's so like, it's both person, like super personal. And also like, there's this wall in between everybody. Cause when you're sitting next to them, you can hear all the little intonations in their voice and you can like feel their energy. And like, there's a person there that you can, but when you're doing some of these scenes cause they're so like intimate and you can't see the other person and sometimes your audio cuts out so you can't hear how they say, say the line and you're like I don't know how I'm like if what I'm reading is a correct response to that but that that was difficult for me but um I think I, I agree with everyone else that it, this is just super cool to, that we're able to do something like this and people everywhere are able to watch it and experience it rather than like because you can't drive across the state to come see all these readings. So, yeah. Yeah, it is cool. We have people from all over the state, from Jackson, from Cody, from Casper. Um, there were a whole bunch. Um, and, and like from all over the country too, coming in from, from New York and other, there were other names that I saw in here. I'm like, oh, they moved away and I missed them. John Weeby's out there. <laughs> um, but it's just like really amazing to, to like be able to, to connect with everybody here mm -hmm. on this platform and to have Shanna here from LA. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. <laughs> we had a related question that um, again, we might want to go to about what if we didn't have these platforms or things like Zoom, which would enable, is there a way that we can still share theater at this time without these kind of platforms? Read plays. Go to, <laughs> pick up a play and read it. I mean, <laughs> write your own play. Write, write a play and send it to a friend and, and say, read this and give me your thoughts or, or like one of those what is exquisite corpse you like write a scene and then send it to your friend and have them write the next scene and send it to their friend and have them write the next scene <laughs> i'm spitballing here i don't know any other ideas <laughs> those are good ones. Snail mail. and i was thinking if you go uh online and just look you'll find out in different countries particularly in italy they they tend to like opera but with people on their balconies there are these great videos now with their coming out or musicians on their front porch in places in the U.S. So um, I think you can find that there are a lot of different ways people are trying to make community while maintaining social distancing but using whatever talents they already have to make a live event as it were that at least a small audience of people can enjoy which is really wonderful to watch yeah. It is a beautiful thing to see people just, we just have this natural longing desire to have shared experiences. And no matter, I guess, no matter what kind of entertainment we have now plugged into our, our homes, mm -hmm. like we, we were always gonna have that necessity, that need to like be connected with people, share an experience. And like, that's what the arts are about. It's not going anywhere. 
maybe as a way to carry that idea forward, uh, we had a question asking about how has your interpretation of the material, even for those who are coming to it uh, new for the first time, uh, not having had been at the rehearsal we did on, where we were thinking of an on-campus event, how has your readings of this material been affected by what's happening right now with social distancing for COVID-19? I mean, for me specifically, um, Antigone RK, mm -hmm. man, like the first time it hit me and then even again tonight, hitting me again hard of just like, Mm -hmm. The weight that we put on to um, how we are perceived in the world and how people put things upon us, but also now that we live in this world of social media, like how we put that weight upon ourselves to make this perception of, of something that we want to be seen. And it may be completely different than who we are morally. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, that, that play for me specifically just like sunk in. I know when we were doing rehearsals, I mentioned that every time they talk about bodily contact in the play, it seemed highlighted compared to when we had done the rehearsal um, in the week of, of March 12th. And I was, I was kind of curious in the, in the last play, why do you think uh, Antigone keeps asking Harold to touch her, to touch her face? Leah, do you have thoughts? Oh. Yeah, I think it's it's a surreal experience, you know, being mm -hmm. dead, which I I'm I'm assuming it's a surreal experience where you're like stuck in a room with a bunch of books that are all of these people's lives that are just written down for you to like flip through and to have somebody there is also like mind blown cuz you you don't think of when you die you're going to be with like that one person and having somebody follow you and because he loved her so much and he wanted to be there I think part of it is part of it was Antigone trying to hold on to that that connection with this person but also so she can keep reminding herself that he is there mm -hmm. just to have somebody just touch you, touch you. And I mean, it's it's a very intimate thing to just touch somebody's face, especially. It's not like a pat on the shoulder. <laughs> when she died alone. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, it must be so comforting to have just that, that very intimate, Sometimes like even more, I, some, I feel like touch, like a touch of the face is mm -hmm. even more um, connected than, than a kiss or a hug or an embrace because it is such a vulnerable thing to, to have your face be held. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and to have that. I, I In that same piece for me, I mean like, Irene speaks like I just I Irene it gets me like it's just like a stake in the heart with with everything this idea of Irene carrying the weight of the world on her shoulders um, mm -hmm. and conflating all of these atrocities and not being able to to let it go and to to have rest and ease and peace and to feel that she is utterly alone with that burden like these these lines of um oh antigone i am so alone so completely alone so unnaturally alone um and i think before we were all in social distancing and and self-quarantine and stay at home um you know it those lines i could empathize with her i could i could imagine what that circumstance would would feel like of just not having anyone else to share her plight with. Um, but it does take on a whole other meaning when we're in the midst of a global pandemic and like, I live alone, mm -hmm. you know? I, <laughs> aside from my cat, there's nobody here. <laughs> um, which is wonderful then when my parents like come and drop off groceries, thanks mom and dad, you're the best, I love you. Um, but like that, it, it just, it, 
it rings true on a, a totally different level. This idea of of not having others to to share with, to be with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, to sort of pick up on that, um, we've had a, another question uh, from our audience asking us uh, that the themes in Antigone, this play that uh, Sophocles wrote approximately 2,400 years ago, uh, was had, a, had two themes about faithfulness and determination, at least on the part of Antigone. Although I think you could make a good argument that Ismene and Hyman, right, have that as part of their characters too. And you can see something in the adaptations in each of the five plays, I think of that. And the question is asking us, how do those themes that were in Sophocles' Antigone and in the plays we saw tonight, how did that parallel, parallel our own ways and our own determination to offer this play? Um, despite the fact that our original event was canceled four and a half hours before the actual performance, um, and that now we have the social distancing. And I, and I can say, I know when it got canceled, right, it was very disappointing. We'd had this wonderful rehearsal. And then we're faced with this idea of, well, how, how can we still bring this to people and make it something that was alive? And I know that was what Anne was spending at least a good week, week and a half, you know, working on to two weeks, figuring it out. Yeah. And you might want to maybe point to some of those things, Anne. Um, so, yeah, I mean, like, what is it about the Greeks that we just continually tell these stories over and over and over again? I mean, we have literally been reviving this story for 2,500 years. Um, and I read something today, um, and I have a whole bunch of notes jotted down here, so I wanna find it because I think it really, it speaks to this. Um, but just like this, you know, we have this, just even in Antigone Project, we have a play cycle of, one story that then builds on the next, then builds on the next one builds on top of that, the next one builds on top of that, the next one builds on top of that. But even in that last one, there is this idea of, okay, we're going back. So there is this like already cyclical nature of, of each of these interpretations informing the next based on the time period, the, um, the, the world circumstances, the society, um, but I think that something for me that was so wonderful about doing Antigone Project um, is the fact that here we have like five multiracial women defining these issues. And that's, that was not always, I mean, definitely in ancient Greece, you weren't gonna have the women like defining the issues. Um, but I think that it, it allows us to to look at the story through a different lens. And, and I think that what these plays accomplish, and I'm not, I, I, I wouldn't say that this is not uh, something that were it a male translation or a male adaptation, uh, that, that that could not be the case. I, but, but ultimately I do feel like what, what the story of Antigone and what, what Antigone Project does is it, it really shows us this, this drive to like rise out of, of conflict and injustice and hardship to rise out of the current of, of history of all that has come before and to re-envision new possibilities, to re-envision new means for hope. And I mean, I love that it ends with, with Red again and with, with basically Antigone saying, I don't wanna go back. It's terrible back there and it's horrible. People are dying. There's, there's, there's so much inequity, there's war, there's, there's plague. There's like, everything is awful back there. Why do I, I don't wanna go back, no. The, to then come to a place where she's like, okay, yeah, let's go back and um, let's make it better. And so for me, I think that that's really what it's about is that this story ultimately does bring us through the turmoil to a place where we're like, okay, so what can we do? How can we make an impact? How can we, how can we use what we have learned to make the world a better place? 
And I feel like <laughs> that is desperately needed right now. Mm -hmm. If we could ask a question that maybe the different Antigones as well as the different versions of Hymen and Ismene could address. We've had several questions coming in about the order of the plays and the project. If the order had been changed, how would the arc of the character of Antigone changing? And I was thinking of several lines that Antigone says in different plays and whether they might relate to each other. So if we start with the line in Hain 10, where that Antigone says boundaries are for cowards. And I was wondering, do we see any kind of arc with that comment through the plays amongst the different Antigones and Ismenes and the Hymens? How the actors felt about that. I think for like that specific line, I think that's with Antigone throughout every single, I think in every single one, she says something about like the not, agreeing with the laws and wanting to go over the boundary, wanting to run into the ocean or, you know, do something that's breaking that. So I think that was, was pretty, you know, it was with every Antigone, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think. And I think in the order of it, it, it starts out as just like anything else, an idea, and then it builds upon to like moral, to action, to, like Anne said, ending with like, let's go back and do it again and let's make it better this time. So mm -hmm. just like the order is perfectly built upon each story. Yeah, um, last night, or not last night, when we rehearsed this um, over Zoom, uh, it was that night that I realized that with the order that they're in right now, it mm -hmm. it is basically like, like it starts with Antigone telling Ismini that she wants to get their brother's body. And then there she is in a uh, medallion asking Creon for the body. And then, you know, it like, it, it continues in the rough structure of Antigone, um, which kind of blew my mind, honestly. I hadn't really realized <laughs> that. Um, and I think that obviously if if they were in a different order, I don't, I mean, it's, it's Antigone still, it's Antigone through and through. And in every single play, she has that bite and that fire and she's gonna do what she thinks she needs to do. Um, but I do think that the way that it's crafted, it, it, it just, it, it reveals more and more like, you know, in, in Hang 10, boundaries are for cowards. Mm -hmm. just, just those little, like, and she says that she wants more freedom of motion, but she's not doing anything about it quite yet. And we just see that keep growing and growing until in red again, she's exhausted. She has fought and fought in every single play that we've seen so far. And just, she's been put through the ringer in every incarnation, um, but she still goes back. She still comes back to do it for us. That's Antigone. How about our hymen to Harold? From surfer to, to general. You know, yeah. And then to Harold, <laughs> which actually Harold actually does mean something like war leader. So yeah, oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I. Does he have an arc in how he's developing? Yeah, I would say so. I think um, you know when the the surfer makes his entrance he's just got that one bulky monologue and um he's sort of just laying it all out on the line um and it doesn't feel as though that speech is very well thought out i feel like he's just sort of like here's everything that i'm feeling and i need to make sure that i'm putting it all out on the table um and then by the time we get to um red again with harold it's very Well, what am I trying to say? It's a lot more well thought out. I think Harold is, um, obviously he, he meditates a lot. He spends a lot of time um, either, you know, really seriously contemplating issues or, um, you know, trying to clear his mind of the, the funk, if you will, all the, the excess that might be, you know, clouding your, your judgment and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, if for, for no other reason, just thinking about uh, those characters like I, I don't know that mm -hmm. his story would have been as effectively told if they were in a different order 
um, mm -hmm. for that reason. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about Antoinette as the development of Antigone. Um, she's there when Medallion begins. And I was wondering uh, if Olivia had any thoughts about how'd she get in that office? Because he is, you know, the general is so surprised by her getting in. I'm not sure. <laughs> um, I don't know. Their conversation is really interesting, though. They both want mm -hmm. to. Um, I don't know, it was cool to read it a second time and kind of see like what was really being said. But as far as her getting there, I'm not sure. That one's interesting in the in the few moments where there are lines about like he calls her an apparition. Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like it's a little bit Southern Gothic -y in some in some senses. Not not extremely, but but on, I mean I feel like there also could be just the um the the disparate socioeconomic reality that like if she's misconstrued as the help like maybe she's just mm -hmm. going in there to clean yeah. um because that's who would be cleaning carlton's office i was wondering if it was something like the stenographer the two other women who are working in the office who you know were willing to let her in so that when the general came she could see him, you know, this notion of sisterhood, which seemed to be such a strong theme through all of the plays, uh, picking up on something that was in Sophocles, but developing it way more for these, these plays from a from female author's perspective. And I was wondering, how did it feel for those who were going back and forth between the roles of Antigone and Ismene or other characters on um, the power of sisterhood, whether it's small or writ large? Did, in, in other words, did your perspectives change as you were changing in, in the different parts, uh, the characters you were playing? Um, yeah, I would say that like at the end when I'm playing um, Irene, I think that conversation that her and Antigone have is really powerful and mm -hmm. it's cool to see more of like Irene's perspective. And I remember reading that and just kind of trying to think like, where do I stand with the two of them? You know, do I lean more towards Antigone? Do I lean more towards Irene? And then, you know, what that means for the two of them and what they're willing to risk for each other, the structure of their family alone. Um, you can see that in the first reading, um, when Ismeni says something about like, aren't I family? Mm -hmm. yeah. So the other relationships are really complex. And I think, I don't know, sometimes certain like situations allow me to be um, siding more with Antigone or siding more with Ismeni, so. I just, to be honest, I didn't remember Ismeni from the story. <laughs> so it was really beautiful to like start out with that and just like, discover a relationship that I hadn't realized before. And it does kind of start out in that story in Hington mm -hmm. with, with the dynamic of the just the two very like day and night kind of sisters and their bickering and mm -hmm. um, to the depth that it goes by the end where like, I feel like Irene has been changed in a way by her sister. Like how do people, specifically, I guess family like, even if we can have different opinions, but we can come to one conclusion that like, this is like how people should be treated. And no matter how like different our other ideas are that we can still connect with mm -hmm. each other and change and move and discover and grow. Leah, did you have any, or Alex, some thoughts? Um. Like going back to Olivia with reading the the fight scene between uh, Antigone and Ismene, mm -hmm. uh, I love that sister dynamic. And I mean, I never, I didn't get to grow up with a sister or like somebody there to challenge you in that way. And I love that they're so similar yet so different. They both want the same thing, just mm -hmm. their paths to getting there are so different. And for me right now, I like I. I connect more with Ismene on that on the term of like we have like waiting and not doing the big acts of like here's how we're gonna change everything. 
but now I'm realizing that it's probably good to have like that balance between the two of them. And I think seeing their story go through it, because with my experience with um, Antigone, Ismene was always, Ismene was always like, she was so passive and she was just there. Like, I remember reading the story in some class and I feel like if you took her out, it just like wouldn't have changed anything. But now it's so different that she is, she needs to be there to balance Antigone's mm -hmm. fire, yeah. Yeah, um, I also, I grew up, I'm an only child, so I didn't have any siblings around. Um, so obviously I don't have any firsthand experience with that kind of relationship. Um, and I think that with these particular sisters, of course, it's really easy to, to you know, shoot Ismini down to be like, oh, she didn't try, she didn't fight, but she, she fought to stay alive. She did what she thought she needed to do and she's alive and that's worth something. Um, and I just think I, I really like, uh, not like, I guess, well, I guess, um, at the, in, in Red Again, when they do show the, the fight and Harold says, you know, you were very harsh or whatever that line is. It's just, I think uh, you were severe. Yeah, severe. <laughs> <laughs> um, that just, that really hits me every time because from what I understand, obviously, again, no siblings, there are some things that you can say when you're arguing with your siblings that maybe you can't say to people who are not related to you without <laughs> sounding much worse than it is. Um, and so just that, just the fact that, you know, she could be so severe, she could be so cruel, and still here is Irene, such, so much mourning and such grief and still talking, like still trying to talk to Antigone after she's gone. And she's the only one really that, that understands. Um, and that just really, it, it hits me really hard, just that that's such a strong bond that you can have. And not to say that, you know, you can't have that kind of thing with people you aren't related to, because sisterhood is a bond in many ways. But just, I think that that's just one of the most important bonds that you can have. And I wanted to pull in Jared here about the bonds you're having with the characters when you get to be both the cousin and the boyfriend, fiance. Mm. Yeah, um, it's uh, really exciting as an actor to be able to do uh, a bunch of, uh, be a part of a bunch of different relationships within a piece. Um, it's really fascinating to, uh, obviously like we've all spent like a little bit of time with the script. So going through and trying to figure out like, okay, this is how I feel about Antigone in, in this piece versus this one. Um, obviously the, um, the the sort of Hyman parallel characters, the ones who are fighting for her affection, are quite different from the relationship that she has with um, uh, you know General Carlton and Medallion. Um, so yeah, I guess that's the that's the biggest difference. And then within all of these you know piney lover boys, um, trying to. I guess like more deeply assess the the tone of the piece because that really has the emotions that each individual playwright is trying to elicit like that has a, a really big impact on how the relationship plays out even if it's all kind of based on the same relationship. I thought it was interesting that in um, in Red Again that Hyman is given an opportunity to do something that is hinted at that his father is afraid of this notion that you actually did form a rebellion yeah. against mm -hmm. the ruler, which Hyman makes clear to his father isn't his intention in Sophocles, but as a development of his character, you had that opportunity to say, yeah, I did after you, you, let, you, you had died, I was willing to, to carry on the, um, the revolution that if you wanna put it that way, or the rebellion or the questioning of authority to the extreme of attempting to kill the ruler, yeah. yeah. It was very cathartic to have a, a happy ending, I guess, as happy as it could be, <laughs> relatively speaking. And it, it puts into an interesting perspective a question, another question from Antigone that was in that, which was about you can't, um, that rage was necessary for change, that you can't change the world by meditating. Um, yeah. And so I was just sort of wondering if we go to that question 
how you how our actors saw that as they were going through their different characters in the five different plays. Was there some truth to that? Or did I, you see I, another development? Yeah, please. Uh, yeah. Because I don't know, personally, as a young college kid in this political environment where everything is being thrown in your face and you're like, you're supposed to think this and you're supposed to think that. I think a lot of my generation, we like to sit behind our screens and watch it all happen. And we don't like to actually do things about it. I've had such in-depth conversations with people my age, even about voting. And I, it just, it baffles me that the choice of to vote and to not vote is even a question that we should be having. Cause that's our, that's our say. That's like the little thing that we get to uh, uh, like help or put in, put our two cents into everything. But um, I think we're just, I don't know. I feel like we're very passive right now. Mm -hmm. and we can't complain about not have getting things done and then not doing like not doing anything about it. There was a great question about I mean so this play it's looking at all of these different Antigones in different um, historic periods. This like kaleidoscopic view of Antigone um, in different times and places and locations. I'm thinking I had a question for myself, which. I think it's kind of funny, but also cool, just speaking about sisterhood that my sister then put the same question in the chat, but of, you know, how has today's Antigone changed? This idea that there is a former Antigone in Red Again, that Antigone is going back and thinking about, well, then who would Antigone be today? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, yeah, I, I mean, like, I'm thinking about it, I'm like, well, who, who is that, like, female rebel or the one who like really believes in this strong cause and is like she knows that there's governmental institutions stacked against her but she's going for it anywhere way and I'm like okay like young women in politics or young climate change warriors but I don't know I'd, I'd love to hear from everybody else or also like in the chat if if, if people have opinions um like who is today's Antigone. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts? Actors, do you have thoughts? It's a good question. <laughs> I haven't really thought about it, so I'm trying to process right now. AOC, <laughs> that's in the, that's in the comments. <laughs> Yeah, I would say Greta. I yeah, think, yeah. I was also thinking. I was Greta. thinking of all the reaction, the bat, the 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 reaction against her, the various attempts to try to downplay her message or what she's doing. As you're young, you're female, you're not yet out of school. The different kinds of ways that it's construed. Yeah. We've also had a suggestion of Elizabeth Warren. Yeah. And again, I think even though older, you get the same reaction that when people want to tear you down they, they, or to diminish what you're saying, they'll attack you based on gender, um, based on ethnic background, perceived or otherwise, yeah. Did anyone have anyone else they'd like to mention? Did your sister bring up anyone? No. Greta. No, she said Greta. Yeah. Which is true. Yeah. We did also have a question, um, and this would be for maybe Jared, if you want to think about it. A question about how do you, so when we were talking earlier, you, you essentially have three points that you come in, or three characters that come in at different points in, in the arc of the entire project. And how did you feel about General Carlton, how he fit into that arc? Because initially he does seem to be very different and you were identifying him with Creon um, more than Hyman it sounded like, yeah. Um, yes, um, and that it may be in part because I mm -hmm. am 
not a Greek scholar and don't remember a ton of specifics about Antigone. <laughs> um, it's, not, it's not a bad identification. It is a strange thing. It's not a character who's saying I'm related to Antigone or Ismene. Mm -hmm. And it is a person who's saying that he's in charge, at least of that office and of, and of the messages coming out of that office and refusing yeah. to give Antoinette what she's asking for. So it's a good mm -hmm. identification, yeah. Yeah, I think, um, I think Carlton's probably the most complex character that I play in the cycle because um, he the whole time is saying like, I, I can't do this. I can't give your brother a medal. It's, it's not gonna happen. I don't have the authority. Um, and some of it comes off very, very cold um, as if you know he, he doesn't even wanna try, but there are a, couple of moments where um and this is partially how I'm reading it and then there were like a couple of stage directions that informed that for me but there are a few moments where he's he softens up a little bit he mm -hmm. he gets to sort of um he gets to level with Antoinette and be like look I I hear you like we're very different but I understand where you're coming from and that really sucks <laughs> um so yeah I don't know I've got I have a lot of feelings about Carlton, mm -hmm. <laughs> stuff I'm still figuring out. I thought it was interesting where, as he's getting toward the end, maybe one part where he seems to be changing very much is where he tries to identify with her by saying that he's lost people from his family too mm -hmm. in the war. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. That part kills me. <laughs> it's the first like real bit of openness, I think. One of the things about Medallion that stood out to me today, and it's not in the text, it's just the time period that it is placed in that like had me rethinking about it entirely now, as opposed to a few weeks ago, is that it's set in 1918. And the last time that our country had a massive pandemic, what, you know, Spanish flu was in 1918. And there's nothing about, there's nothing in the text that like harkens back to that, but it does me in a mindset of like oh like not only is there the atrocities of war um and this racial divide but like there are also our people all over dying from from something that is not um warfare but is biological and natural that's true. Yeah. That could be how part of the how her brother died. I don't didn't think. No, that. no, she, he died in war. Um, <laughs> it's and like I said, that like this, that's such a that's an outlier. Just the there was it was just one thing that I was like, oh, 1918. I've been reading that date a lot recently, mm -hmm. but not for the reasons of the play that we have here in Antigone Project. If I was in Antigone Arcade, when I found that for me to be one of the more, most interesting ones with these different versions of Antigone. Um, and what I thought was interesting about a casting decision was that it's all female voices there who are controlling the story and the memories of Antigone. And I was wondering for the actors who are playing that, had that had they thought of that at all? Because I, I've um, explored other versions where there had been a choice to cast as the archivist a male voice, where then controlling the vi different versions of female Antigones. And I was just sort of wondering if, if that had struck you while you were going through that that's one of the pieces where Jared wasn't cast in a part. I will say that I definitely thought about that because I did the casting, <laughs> yeah. um, but I thought about that in terms of where where does the male voice belong in this? And there, so so we just had a comment um, saying that one of the things Claire Mason, my sister, she says one of the things I really appreciate about the whole cycle is the way in which the various male archetypes are explored, even within the larger conversation of strength and femininity. 
Um, and so I, like, that is something that I, I think that that feeds into this same sort of directorial choice where I was like, do with this, with the heart of this play, mm -hmm. where does the, where does the male voice belong in this? Um, and, and then thinking about like, well, what would, what would the world look like if it were women? And, and also this idea of like, maybe let's strip away um, typical stereotypes or gender norms and just have these be people making choices about the identity of figures from the past and what we pass on. Um, it's, you know, it was a sort of similar choice uh, in terms, in, in my mind of, of directing um, that went into the thought process behind an Iliad from, from last year and last fall in the sense of, okay, well, what if we have a female um, poet and a, a male muse? Like what, mm -hmm. how, how does that change when we, when we either defy what is prescribed or put in order um, or just challenge these, these ideas? Um, so I guess I was just being a little bit rebellious in the spirit of Antigone. <laughs> but actors, I don't know what, especially, well, I guess all of you guys in terms of what, what are your thoughts of, you know, Antigone RK, all ladies. Um, I think it's um, having an all female cast for that one kind of, helps make the the message a little more universal in some ways because mm -hmm. um, I think having uh, a man as the archivist would have implied more themes of like um, you know white men like discovering things and then it's their story now and that would have been totally in line with the, the themes of the rest of the works and in the original um, play but I kind of like the idea of um, I don't know, not focusing on like the the gendered aspect of it so much and sort of universalizing it as like everyone takes things from the past and there's no way to know 100% what happened. So there's, there's things that get changed, things get glossed over every time we look into the past for something. We have an audience uh, saying, yeah, agreeing, a male archivist would really change the whole dynamic of the piece. Uh, that there's something so powerful about having female voices controlling the memories. Which then is really interesting when we flash forward in the cycle to um, Irene saying they own my memories, mm -hmm. uh, which brings in those ideas of surveillance and um, the like invasive nature of of the government or the these institutions or the the tyrants, the people in control on the the personal aspects of our lives. I um with the with the all female cast, I, I actually hadn't really noticed that until tonight. Um, but I I think that with um, having a a woman play the archivist, I don't know if it was just specifically uh Leah how you were reading it but it felt like even as you were saying you know all these horrible things that happened and just like those are the facts it felt like you were saying them with care and with empathy still and I just feel like that's that's really nice because then I feel like all of the like everybody in that story is is or everyone in that play is kind of telling the story with care and softly I guess and just like it's a sad story and it felt like everybody knew that and was was reacting to that going along those lines I mean you just came out of mm -hmm. of the one before where you have this huge male presence in General Carlton mm -hmm. that, like he's very prominent <laughs> he's prominent there and it I don't know for me it was kind of a nice breather from like the Antigone versus the male patriarchy to have just this was her story and this is how it's changed through history like kind of ideal 
we did have a question about about casting in the sense that um that the the play typically calls for two male actors was casting one specific artistic choice or a limitation of changing the pre presentation medium um and so initially um we still just had a cast of five with only one male actor um rather than a cast of six with two male actors um and so that wasn't necessarily um, a casting choice due to limitations of the virtual means. Um, but for me, and, and this, is, this is something that like, where I wish that we just would have had more time for where I could have put more effort into casting and outreach, um, but I wouldn't have cast two white male actors. And so, so I said, you know what, Jared can, Jared has it, like he can do all four of these, this is doable. Um, and um, you know the the conversations that I were having with with um, people of color were were not coming to fruition in terms of getting actors for for that, and that was, and that's just something that I am continually needing to work on. So the play A Stone's Throw, that one I've noticed there's interesting. Um, commentary on it because it's been pointed out that that's the one that moves farthest away from the source material. So Sophocles, Antigone dies by her own hand, a choice of suicide in a cave where she's been entombed by Creon. She doesn't get her marriage. She doesn't get her child, which she which she talks about and, and longs for and sings with a chorus there uh, as she's walking to her death. And uh, but Lynn Nottage gives her that opportunity to have that. And I thought that was sort of an interesting way to keep that relay of the story of this arc of Antigone's life going in that play where she will be given some kind of union, however brief it was. And she does get a child um, that can survive her. But she's, she's put into this interesting position in her conversations with her, her sister there. And it goes back to some points that you made, um, particularly, I, I think, about wondering about Ismene in Sophocles being represented as perhaps the more passive of the two sisters. But this Ismene here, she doesn't seem passive at all to me. She's talking about a strategy to save her sister's life of that will go through a husband and, and selling the family possessions to try to um, persuade through monetary means whoever is gonna be judging this case. And I was wondering how the actors who were in that particular story felt about this version of this Antigone, of an Antigone as a, as a person who will have that relationship and eventually a child. or of the Ismini in it, yeah. Sorry, is it possible that you could reframe the question? Oh, certainly. Um, it's a maternal Antigone, which is is due. It's a it's a wonderful development for her character. It's what it's what Sophocles' character wanted but was denied. And so Lynn Nottage gives her what she wanted in a sense. That was one way I looked at it. And I was wondering, how does that change being a maternal Antigone? What kind of depth to the character? And for Ismene being an aunt, having another generation, knowing that the family is gonna survive one more generation at least. I'm surprised it doesn't change more. I felt like um, I would have expected Antigone to have made a different decision considering a child, but then ultimately is still like herself and it's still like she fights for her values. And then as many like will, you know, step up to make sure that the child's okay and all of this stuff. But I think, I don't know, I'm surprised that she wouldn't have leaned more towards as many and like, you know, just had kind of taken, put this, chosen her battles a little differently and had take put this one aside for the sake of the child. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's kind of how I look at it. I don't know. I thought this one was interesting because in all of the other ones, Antigone has been so 
radical in her thoughts and this one she just she met a guy um she met a guy she met a guy and and uh, what is this what is this she looks back but i mean she she just that's what she wanted to be loved and then this child happened which like life happens so i th- i thought that was the a fun dynamic where it, Ismene was more of the radical one of the we're gonna forget about it we're gonna sell all these things we're gonna do all this thing and Antigone was like I just met a dude he carried my basket home like (laughs) it's not really the I'm gonna go like burn things and go to riot Antigone that we we see in the other ones but I do feel like what we see in the other ones is an Antigone that embraces death Mm mm-hmm Like she just, she's like, okay, my fate is death. Great. Let's do it. Let's go. I mean, not great, but like, but you know, it's that, I feel like that is the, the constant of this, this woman that is going to stare death in the face. She's going to do that, which I think is, um, perhaps if I may, a a decent segue to talk to Rachel a little bit about the artwork and, um, and the, the joint exhibit. We've had some questions about Rachel and Laura's curation of the art. Um, I know something that when, when I was talking to Rachel and Katie about the different exhibits, I was really enticed by this, um, not only because it was an excellent opportunity for collaboration with Laura's class, but also this idea of the female um, role in in ushering in in death. Um, so I don't know if Laura and Rachel, if you guys could share a little bit about about the artwork and that and the curation of those pieces and and how how the two mm-hmm. resonated with one, how how the play and the and the exhibit. Um, interact with one another? Yeah, Um, we can definitely do that. Uh, Laura, please chime in (laughs) as well. Um, So uh, the slideshow that was at the beginning um, before the reading started, as well as during the break, um, those are all works of art that are currently on view excuse me, in our galleries, which are currently unfortunately closed. Um, But these were works of art that we selected um, for Lara's class. And you might be looking at them and thinking, most of these don't look Greek. And you're right, they're not. And that was on purpose. Um, So the theme that we were working with as we were looking for art objects for Lara's class um, was like, death and female agency in death and the afterlife Mm -hmm. and what might that also look like in other cultures. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was kind of our starting point um, as we made choices about what was going to go into the gallery. The the, uh, exhibit is in conjunction with the class I'm teaching this semester. Uh, classical Greek civilization, which takes a very broad approach to Greek culture, starting, well, technically with the Frankthi cave in 38,000 BCE, but um, basically, let's say Homer in the 8th century, and then going into the Hellenistic period, so about the 200s BCE is about where we're going to end. And I was curious to, uh, I have as a theme of the course to try to guide all the readings that we're doing of primary text and translation a theme of looking at what's our position in this world and what's our position in a possible life that might happen after this world because it was something that I could find in so many of the texts and it was something that um, I'll just say obsessed the Greeks. They lived short crappy lives on average. Uh, We can live up to three times longer than the average Greek person today because of all the innovations we've had in uh, healthcare, vaccination, sanitation, when you put lots of people on top of each other. And so I was curious, how did other cultures approach this? Approach this? What did they think death was? And what happened after death? And so then uh, Rachel was able to pull a series of works when I gave her those kinds of ideas. And from those, I can pick a selection. And then we have to look at the works. They have to go through 
a process where they're judged uh, safe enough to exhibit, as I recall. And we had at least one piece that had to be um, substituted, but we were able to find another one that came from the same culture. Yes, that was the um, sculpture from Pop and Kitty, I think. Mm -hmm. um, let me see if I can pull the slideshow up. It's a little easier to talk. Um, screen share. Um, so let's see the, the piece that we were just talking about um, is this is this piece um, from Papua New Guinea. Um, it's an ancestor figure. Um, it's one of the few, I, I think this is one of two female ancestor figures that um, we have in our collection. And the one that Laura and I were initially interested in um, needs to have some conservation work done <laughs> to it. And it was not stable enough to, to show. Um, but, uh, and then these are some details. Um, so, uh, in this culture, men are primarily responsible, um, for, like, most of the rituals, um, and ceremonies and things like that that happen. Uh, these ancestor figures are kept in, like, a men's ceremonial house, and it's a space where women are not allowed to to, to go. Um, the exception is if you come back as, as an ancestor figure um, and you may not be able to give any kind of guidance while you're in this world, but if you can come back as an ancestor, um, you might be able to influence this world um, while you are an ancestor figure or while you come back as an ancestor. Um, so that's, that is, uh, one example, um, and, you know, it was interesting, uh, earlier on in this conversation, uh, the, um, importance of touch and physical contact came up, and I was just thinking, most of these pieces, actually, I don't know if any of these pieces, um, show any kind of, like, human contact, like even this. So um, this is actually something very, a very small sculpture. It's carved, it's called a netski um, and it's, uh, it is used to hold a pouch in place um, if you were wearing a kimono um, underneath the obi you would have this string attached to a pouch and the net scale acts as like a counterweight. But it, these are very small and um, one of the challenges of showing anything digital on the screen is that you don't really get the sense of scale. So keep in mind, this is tiny, but even this, there, there's like this little guy and like someone is coming back to to haunt him maybe maybe he didn't pay pay his ancestor like appropriate respect or something of that nature and you know he's coming haunting this little guy um but once again you know they're still not touching that's i don't know it was just an observation that these all really lack a sense like all of the figures are very isolated, I guess. Mm -hmm. There's the suggestion of the possibility. Um, this is probably the one piece where the people are closest together, where there's more than yeah. one figure. But I'm not certain that's happy touching going on in that piece. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> but there's the idea of the possibility of something touching you. And I think that's the, the death um in the cart which as i recall is is from um possibly colorado uh latinx communities um yeah or in new mexico okay yeah um the la sebastiana 
Yeah. Uh, let's see. Because she's poised to strike. And that was, uh, so my students had an opportunity. One of the ways these exhibits work is you bring your classes to them for various sessions. And so we had a session early in the semester where the students look at the exhibits to listen to them, to try to see what messages that they can perceive. And here, one of the things the students thought was interesting is they had read already some material from Homer about the shafts of death of how uh, Apollo and, and Artemis can shoot arrows of death, whether it's into military camps or women within their homes. And so they, they really made a lot of nice connections between this piece and that. Oh, that's great. That's awesome. Yeah. So we have two questions from the audience that we haven't addressed. And I think that maybe that we can ask those and, and let that be a good wrapping up point. Mm -hmm. um, one of them is more specific going back to a stone's throw. Um, Clara asks or says, often I think of Antigone as a young adult. Do you think Lynn Nottage was giving her a more adult stature or was there a conversation about choices and circumstances despite age or conflict? Mm -hmm. I can add that the source material is not completely clear on what age Antigone is. There's lots of stories about her. She goes back at least as far as Homer. And so the question is, how old would she actually have been finally at that point when her brothers came to war? And it's not clear. Hmm. That kind of also like that, that ties back to you know, when we were asking about like who, who is today's Antigone and, um, you know, the comment about Elizabeth Warren living the plight of Antigone for, for years. Mm -hmm. um, but then we've got, you know, Greta, who is in the prime of her youth, you know? I mean, it's, I don't know. I, and I think that that can also speak to the universality of, of this plight and of of this this conflict that she that Antigone um, or that that is presented in Antigone of you know what is as we're as we're driving towards towards sanctity and and justice peace rest um, as we're as we as individuals are striving for that and fighting for that you know what is the best way to do that and in what circumstance or society or scenario do those actions change when you know when is it good to to go along with the restrictions of your government and when are the times when maybe it's also good and advisable to to rise up and push back a bit to 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 make waves to to bring us back to hang 10. Mm -hmm. um, which I maybe is kind of a, a, a neat way to segue into Eric Molvar's question. Um, in some ways, as the Greeks are the patriarchs of European and therefore Euro-American culture, thus the fathers of patriarchy, how much fun was it to deconstruct the patriarchy of the Greeks? I don't know if, if the actors want to speak to that in terms of like, Approaching this work from a female lens. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that that's, this is something that is happening a lot these days. Like my first show at UW was a retelling of Lysistrata mm -hmm. with like mostly females. And it was, so I, I don't know. I think that people are taking the Greeks because they're such easy stories to just tweak a little bit and you get a completely different take on something which is great I love that in theater I just think it's a wonderful thing that we're in a place that we can have a voice and I mean we all of these stories have been repressed for so long and now to like be able to be in a time where we can have this outlet of giving that perspective that has been silenced or hidden or altered in some way for so long. It's, it's 
Nice to feel that. I would argue that we're on our way. <laughs> right. I mean, okay. Yeah. Uh, like, and that's and that like this is me like my own personal feelings rising up here. But like, if you look at the numbers of of female playwrights produced on American stages versus male playwrights, it's still massively disparate. So, so like, you know, we're starting to see more gender equality, but I mean, like, <laughs> starting is not. That's we're the not beginning. There. We're at the beginning. <laughs> so there's there's more work to be done. Which um I think is is I'm gonna I'm just gonna take it unless there's anything else um that that you guys would like to chime in with that question, I might take this and move in a more wrap-up direction. Um <laughs> so for those of you that are familiar with relative theatrics for the last three seasons, we have produced seasons of entirely female authored plays. Um, and next season is no exception. We will be announcing it at the end of this month. So I hope you keep your eyes peeled for that. But in the meantime, since we weren't able to do two degrees in person, we are going to do a virtual live stream reading of it. And so that, and, and so then with, with having our virtual read rent relate and knowing that virtual two degrees was in the works, I thought, you know what, like, let's just do a virtual reading every week this month. So next week, next Friday, the 10th at 7 p.m right here where you are now. Um, well, maybe not the exact same link. I'm not sure how the tech works, but like through the virtual world, um, we are going to be doing a virtual reading of a play by Nora Leahy called Girl with Gun. And it's um, uh, a fictionalized, non it's a, it's a reimagined or it's, what is it? Biological fiction, historical fiction, um, imagining of, um, Lynette Squeaky Fromm, who was one of Charlie Manson's girls mm -hmm. um, and um, was arrested for an attempted assassination of President Ford. Um, so it's a solo show um, telling her story. And uh, we have um, Noelia Antweiler is going to be making her directorial debut with us. <laughs> Um, for that. And so she's, she's going to be virtually directing me and working with Nora, who is um, from Chicago to, to really give that script some life. And so that will happen next Friday, the 10th. Um, and then the following week, we're doing two degrees right here, um, the virtual reading of it. And um, hopefully Tira Plonquist, the playwright, will be joining us. And then again, in thinking about like how we are taking classics or patriarchal stories or Western stories and reimagining them through a female context, on the 24th, we will be doing a play called Feast by Megan Gorety, who is from Iowa, Iowa City, and um, another solo show that is um, building off of Beowulf. And it's the story of um, Grendel's mother. Um, and we have Allison Harkin who is coming to play that role. So we have lined up a whole string of plays for you guys this month for Fridays at 7 p.m. where we'll have virtual storytelling and conversations about the work and their relevance to today, conversations with the playwrights, with one another. Um, chalk and cheese, if you are in Laramie, is going to be pairing wine and cheese for each of those events. So please keep going back and giving them their, your support, um, which in turn is supporting us because Misty at Chalk and Cheese has offered a wonderful, um, a wonderful, wonderful gesture of giving us 10% of all of those sales. So, so everything that you buy there comes back to support the arts as well, um, which is just so greatly needed during this time. Um, also, I think it's crucial at this point to give just yet one more shout out to all of the amazing individuals and entities and organizations that made tonight possible. So huge, 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 huge thank you to you, Laura, uh, for 
everything for being here, for your support, for your just like the connections for making this happen to the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research, um, the Classical Association of the um, Classical Association of the Middle and Western South Organization, um, Wyoming Humanities Council, the University of Wyoming Arts uh, Art Museum, UW Classics, all of these amazing actors, Rachel, Katie, everyone, uh, the Relative Theatrics Board of Directors, um, and all of you who are tuning in at home, um, like, gosh, having something like 80 viewers, that's really, it's really heartwarming. Uh, and it's, for me, like this morning, I was, I was talking to a friend and I was like, I don't know what to expect. I'd like, I just, there's no way for me to know if people want, like, I don't know. And so to see, to see you all um, out there, like showing up, um, it really means a lot. So thank you all so much. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, Laura, would you like to share anything else? Rachel? I thank you again for the collaboration and I thank the actors for their wonderful performances. And I thank Rachel for helping um, to find a way that we can get people to see the artwork uh, while the art museum is closed and, and for the collaborations with her too. Thank you. Yes, thank Rachel, you. Anywhere where people can go to see the art. Um, that's a great question. Uh, on what's today? Friday. On Monday, I'm going to uh, talk to your marketing coordinator to see if there's a place we can leave that PowerPoint or um, I can send it out via a link. Um, but we'll post it on social media. So cool. please follow the art museum. <laughs> yeah. Follow the art museum. Follow uh, around the theatrics. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, and we can put that information in the chat so you can have those links or you can, well, I don't wanna make you scroll up through it all. We'll put that information back in the chat. Um, and yes, please do uh, take a quick moment to fill out the survey. There was a problem with the link earlier in terms of needing um, permission, but I'm pretty sure I solved that. So you should be able to access that survey now. And that's really helpful information for all of us on the programming side to, to bring you the best possible content and programming. So um, thank you to Leah and Olivia and Alex and Jared and Shanna. And thank you to all of you at home. This was Thanks, great. Anne. <laughs> thank you all.